See, that was awesome. <laughs> and, hey, welcome to the river. We are excited that you are here today. Uh, I have just a couple of things I want to throw at you. We've got a busy couple of days here around uh, this church. So today, right after second service, we are having our Connect class. That's for anybody that wants to know more about like church membership or just why we do what we do and what we believe and why we sometimes sing songs that seem to have nothing to do uh, with church the way that we knew it growing up. So that's right after second service. We'll feed you. We've got a ton of food that's uh, that's going to be ready. we got some tacos that we're going to be having today. So, I mean, tacos are worth sticking around for anyway, right? Uh, so if that's you and you signed up, be here. If it's not and you're like, man, I meant to, then just come. Yeah, you don't have to tell anybody unless uh, you just want to, but I'd, I'd love for you guys to show up. So a second one, on Tuesday, we've got a midweek service that starts. Uh, all of these, uh, you know, the requests that we have, hey, do you guys do Wednesday Night Church? Yeah, but it's you know, just for the youth. And so uh, when we talk about uh, coming up with midweek studies and things like that, that's new for us. So uh, this will start on Tuesday night. Uh, if you have uh, the need for child care, you need to tell us that because we we didn't have but one group sign up uh, that said that they might need that. So on uh, Tuesday night from 6 to 7 right here, put that on your calendar. It's going to be an impactful study. Again, uh, Francis Chan's study that Pastor Paul's leading us through. Uh, we did this a couple of years ago, and man, it was really, really moving. Just an awesome time. And so that is, uh, that's coming up on Tuesday, and then every Tuesday from now till uh, just before Thanksgiving, with the exception of Halloween. So if you guys uh, haven't signed up for that, uh, don't worry about it. Just come. So a uh, third one is uh, on Wednesday night, we like fill this room full of like middle and high school kids. Uh, and so one thing I wanted to throw out there is that uh, th Laura and Lawrence Jan and 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 my wife and I are we've gotten the privilege of, of kind of leading that for the last several years and you can't put us in a room with somebody celebrating their 16th birthday that's in our ministry and and then like us not acknowledge it right so uh, happy birthday Abby uh, she knows who she is so yeah yeah uh, she takes all forms of payment Venmo cash app I'm just kidding so 
Speaking of, uh, we do take an offering here at the church. How's you see how that transition went? That was really good. Uh, uh, but we don't pass baskets. We have some uh, boxes in the back, and then we do a lot of that stuff through our app. Uh, and, and all the things that I would say up here from an announcement standpoint, that's all on our app. And so uh, we'd love it if you guys to, to take a picture of that and get on there. But I want to pray over our morning. I want to pray over the offering, uh, the message that Paul's bringing. We're in week two of our series. Uh, and so if you guys would, uh, let's pray together. God, we are, we are humbled by how good you are to us. Uh, we, we, we come into a room and, and we, we start singing praise to you and then we hear these truths about how you care for us, about you forgive us, uh, how you love us. And so this morning, we're, we're humbled at that, God. We pray that in that, in that humility that we would uh, open our hearts this morning to learn something, uh, that we would open our hearts to uh, something that maybe hasn't happened in our hearts in a long time. So uh, we love you for, for all that you do for us, God. We just pray that you be with this this morning. And I pray that you be with the offering, uh, that you would be with everything that happens around here this week. God, that you would continue to be the reason why uh, we join here and we make a big deal out of your son, Jesus, because he's the best. So we love him and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. series called Wake Up the World, and last week uh, we started this off from the book of Romans. We're also going to be there today, continue in Romans. Uh, if you brought your Bibles, we'll be in Romans chapter 8, if you want to go ahead and get there. I wonder, I wonder when we look at, at a title like Wake Up the World, though, if you and I can be tempted to think that it's, it's, it's my job to wake up the world, it's your job to wake up the world, rather than than living our lives with a prayer and from a prayer for God to wake up the world. See, let's not forget that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 for his followers to remain in the world but not of the world. Therefore, you and I, we can live and work from a place uh, and a prayer for God to wake up the world, our world that we live in. That kind of that takes the pressure off of us, if it will, right? See, it's our job to seek God. It's our job to pray continually. It's God's job to move in our world and to wake our world. The title of today's message is From Being Lost to Being Led. From Being Lost to Being Led. For, for those of us here today that, that consider yourselves a, a, a follower of Jesus, a Christian, uh, we get to examine uh, today, a, a life of, of what, what a life looks like of being led by Jesus. Now, for those of us here today that are not followers of Jesus, your presence here today uh, would probably mean one of two things, if not, if not both things. Number one, uh, you've been considering a life of following Jesus, and you have maybe for a little while, and that's why you're here today. Number two, maybe you were promised lunch uh, at your favorite place, which, by the way, both are great reasons for you to be here, so make sure you get that lunch that you are promised. But also, if, if, if today, if you're kind of checking things out and you're not sure, if you're interested in learning more about Jesus today, we hope to show you some of that. See, around 2,000 years ago, Jesus physically walked on this earth. He then handpicked 12 guys to, uh, that were at best a B-team player. Right? But Jesus saw their potential as a dream team. And he walked around with these, these 12 guys and he healed people and he performed many miracles. And, 
And, and then uh, for about three and a half years, they followed Jesus around. They witnessed his teachings. They, they witnessed him dying on a cross as he predicted. They, 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 they saw that he rose from the dead as he predicted. And then he ascended into the clouds, the Bible tells us, leaving not only those men that he invested in, but also you and I with this, this same assignment to follow Jesus and be led by him. Um, only then Jesus, Jesus left his Holy Spirit with us so that it could guide us, so that his Holy Spirit could guide us as we follow him. So today I want to talk about what that might look like uh, from being lost to being led. And I want to kick this off from the book of Romans chapter 8, uh, starting in verse four, uh, 14. Uh, let's, let me get here real quick. It says, for, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. See, there's this, this ongoing question in our culture, who are children of God? Are we all children of God? You ever asked this question or been asked this question? Are we all children of God? Is everybody children of God or just some of us children of God? So God gives us in his word what might, might be the most clear answer in scripture. He says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons and daughters of of God. It, it reads on, it says, For you did not receive this, the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the, the Spirit himself bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. As I read that, I just see it as such beautiful worded uh, encouragement for you and I, isn't it? And so I want to uh, spend some time today unpacking what we just read. Keep in mind that as we, as we gather in a place like this today, that the only way that these moments matter in the grand scheme of our lives is if we consider these words and then we apply these words to our lives and watch as God transforms us into who uh, God has called us to be, into where God has called, has called us to be, into what God has called us to be. So I want to pray and get into it today. Let's pray all over this place today. Bow your heads with me. Father, thank you for giving us your word of truth. God, uh, help it to, uh, to, to guide us and lead us as your Holy Spirit does and and, and God, just be with us today. We, we, we love that, that, that you sent Jesus to die for us. Uh, we, we're, we're so incredibly impacted by his forgiveness, his grace, his love, and his mercy. And uh, so, God, we also ask that you be with the chiefs today as we take on the bears because it really matters. And we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray and we all say amen. amen. Well, I was, um, I was born and raised in, in what at one time was a small town of Branson, Missouri. And I, I grew up in a, in a small home in a small town. I grew up um, on a small budget. I lived on a small farm where we often ate what we raised. And I learned a lot growing up that way. Most of, of who I am today is because of, of that upbringing. And I'll never forget one time that one of our, our mama cows gave birth to a calf, but then uh, she got down, as they, as they say in farm talk, and that's not a good thing when they get down. So this can happen after a cow gives, gives birth due to, you know, calving, cal, I can't even talk, calving paralysis or uh, sometimes a dislocated hip of the cow. And so what happens is they lay down, and when they're down for so long, they can never get back up again. And uh, so growing up, I watched my dad work as he cared for our farm, he cared for our family, he cared for the animals on our little farm, he poured his, his life into all of that. And, and, and when things like this happened, I'd watch as, as my dad would get frustrated, he would get concerned, uh, and he was, he was that this, this day when this cow got down. And so I got to be there with my dad, he might call it helping him, but more or less I was just watching him. But I watched as my dad tried everything that he could do to get that, this, this cow up so that he wouldn't have to put her down. 
And my dad tried everything. He, he prodded her. He used electric, electronic shock. He, he put a halter on her head, and he would, he'd pull the lead rope as we would get behind and try to push, and we would prod her and try to get her up. My dad, it was dangerous. He, he put straps under her body and lifted, tried to lift her body up with the tractor so that, so that she might be able to stand uh, on her own will, and nothing worked this day. And as my dad grew tired and frustrated, I saw this. And I did what any curious yet oblivious kid would do in this moment. I looked at my dad and I asked him, I said, Dad, what are you going to do now? And I'll never forget what my dad said that day um, as he just kind of exhaled. He said, Son, there's nothing left for me to do. And then he said something that I will always remember. I've taken it with me uh, to this, this point and I hope to never forget it. My dad looked at me and said, Paul, if, if anything was going to work, it would have worked by now. And then he said, who wants steak for dinner? And we shot her and we ate her. And it was awesome. So um, end of story. Uh, <laughs> don't awe me. You eat it too. Uh, every, maybe you're like, wow, that's harsh. Like that is depressing. And why did you start the service that way? But actually, I would like to share with you today something much more depressing because I want to show you a, a civilization of human beings that when given the way by our creator, when given the truth and the life by their creator, they instead have constantly and continually all through time chose every other possible way. And you know what? For literal decades, none of it has ever worked. None of it can compare to what God has promised us. And we're still trying it. But just like my dad said to me on that cold evening in that field, if anything was going to work, wouldn't it have worked by now? And I'm not saying that free will, I'm not saying that, that doing what we want to do in life uh, doesn't have its moments for us. I'm not saying that those moments don't feel good from time to time. I'm not saying that, that, those, that we don't have good seasons. But none of those things have ever sustained us, have they? And if it was going to work, it would have worked by now, right? I remember when our oldest son, when Tennille and I's oldest son uh, began to fall behind in school, we started watching his grades kind of drop, and they, you know, they would go from A's to B's and then B's to C's, and we're like, hold up, this is not happening. We're going to start, you know, we're stepping in here. You're going to turn this around, and then they slipped from C to a D and from a D to an F, and so my wife and I, we started removing privileges from him. We would, as we saw his grades slip more and more and not get any better, we, we would take something else. We took his extracurricular activities. We took his fun. We took his hobbies. We took his friends. We were trying everything. We started removing things from his bedroom, y'all. At one point, all he left, had left in his room was a bed and an alarm clock. But as I think back, nothing was working. And so I remember speaking to a counselor. And I said, like, what else can we do? We have literally tried everything. What can we do? And the counselor looked at me and kind of pulled a Jesus here where Jesus would answer a question with a question and the counselor looked at me and said, well, is what you're doing working? And I said, well, no. And now you sound like my dad. <laughs> I thought about it and I thought, well, if it was going to work, it would have worked by now. But nothing was working. And I think, I think for most of us in this room today, for followers of Jesus, maybe there was a moment for you Maybe there was a, a moment that you found yourself broken or a moment you found yourself lost. You found yourself empty or alone or confused and you had to come to the realization in your life and in your soul that I can't figure this out on my own. And then what happened was Jesus revealed himself to you, right? That's what happened to me. He reveals himself to us. And in the book of Romans chapter 8, just before uh, what, what we were reading just now, in verse 12, Paul wrote this. He said, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. As Christians, we, we don't live according to the flesh, do we? 
Isn't that why we all gather here on a Sunday morning? Like, we don't want to live according to the flesh. And for many of us, we tried living according to the flesh. If living uh, to, according to the flesh was going to work, then wouldn't it have worked by now, right? And Paul says in verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Paul says living according to the flesh ends in death. And when I hear that, I'm, I'm taken back to that day with my dad in the field, that cow laying there, the one that died. And I know, listen, I know that this is a lot for 11 a.m. in the morning, right? But, but hang with me because I think often when, often when I talk to people in the lobby out here on Sundays, I love hanging out with people and listening to you. And, and often people come up to me, and, and, and this is going to sound like a humble brag, but people come up to me and they're like, you're so good at what you do. And um, so last week probably was one of the best compliments I've ever received. And they were a new person, and they walked up to me and they said, I love what they said. They said, you're a mouthpiece for Jesus. And I was like, man, I want that tattooed somewhere on me or something. <laughs> Wife is saying, no. No tattoos. A mouthpiece for Jesus. So when people say, you know, when they say things like that to me, immediately when they say, you're so good at this or you're so good at that, immediately I'm like, hold up, hold up, up. First of all, keep going. Like, tell me more about me. Talk about me. Keep talking about me if you can. I had some things I was going to do, but I canceled them. I just want to hear you talk about me. No, but, but seriously, when people say nice things like that to me, I, I can't help but think, well, yeah, but but listen, I, I've dabbled in other ways. I've, metaphorically speaking, I've driven other routes in life. I've sat in other classrooms of life, and, and, and I've, I've worked things from every other angle that I could, and none of them have worked for me. So let's not try and ignore the fact that, 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 that those things is what got me to this place. I remember being at points in my life where I'm like, well, well, that didn't work out the way that I thought it would. I remember coming to places and going, that, that didn't give me the results that I really wanted long term. I remember looking at things and going, that hurt me. That crushed me. That nearly killed me. That only confused me more. And then finally, I made it to a place in my life where I was like, maybe what God has for me can actually fulfill me. And I'm just, I'm just speaking for personal experiences here. But living by the flesh for me hasn't really worked for me. And so we're left to ask, well, what's the alternative for that? I want to be led by the Spirit of Jesus. Because what I've found is when I'm led by the Spirit of Jesus, that life actually delivers for me. When I'm led by the Spirit of Jesus, this life leads to fulfillment. This life leads to satisfaction. This life and, and, and being led by the Spirit, it, it, it ends in contentment and, and, and I, it builds my relationships and I have connection with people and eventually I have eternity with Jesus Christ. And, but but let, me, let me just kind of be, be real here today because when you're a pastor and you stand up on the stage and you start off with, uh, today we're going to talk about being led by the Spirit. So often the response can be, mm, okay, I mean, it's not real attention grabbing, right? Being led by the Spirit. I don't, I don't really know that that's a, a real appealing topic, you know, being led by the Spirit. Or if you're like me and you've been around churchy people most of your life with, with some churchy attitudes and churchy egos, as, as maybe some of us have seen in our lives, let's just call it what it is. When somebody stands up and says, we're going to talk about being led by the Spirit, those people are weird. They act weird. When you say somebody's being led by the Spirit, they act weird. They, they tend to respond weird. They even talk weird. They talk with a more breathy tone, if you've noticed, like, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, just, you know, you see these people and you walk up to them and they say they're being led by the Spirit. And you talk to them, you're like, hey, how you doing? And they're like, living right, living free. I'm in the Lord, brother. And you're like, oh, okay, like, I, I'm fine, thanks, you know. I'm being led by the Spirit. People who are led by the Spirit can come off sometimes as kind of an elite club, can't they? I'm, I'm led by the Spirit. I've I met Jesus 64.5 years ago when I was six months old. 
So I don't, I don't expect for it to be easy for you, brother. And you're like, did he just call me brother? Like, am I, are we related? Uh, did I not know? Did, you know, don't, don't expect for it to happen to, overnight for you to be led by the Spirit, brother. So I'll pray for you to be led by the Spirit, but you be ready because it can take decades, and it's hard. And so we look at that, and we're like, no, I'm good. I think I'm good. I don't, I don't know that I want to be led by the Spirit. And it's weird, or at least those, some, of, some of those people are, but let me encourage you today, being led by the Spirit doesn't have to hold hands with weird. Okay? So how do, we, how, do we, how do we move from being lost to being led by His Spirit? And the Bible, it lays it out pretty clearly here. I, I, just, I want us to, to read this again. In, in, in Romans 8, 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. So I want to make sure you catch this. Did you see it? Here's, here's what this says. It says, it's for children. It's for children. Therefore, you're a child, and I'm a child, and we are children of God. How many times have you and I heard that in our lives and heard that in church? Children of God, children of God, children of God. But maybe we've missed something here because look what Jesus says in Mark 10, verse 15. He says, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Like a child is what Jesus says. I think of that, about that and I think I'm a dad. My children have learned to follow me as I lead them in life. Literally, physically, I've led them. They grab a hold of my hands at a very young age, and I walk with them. When my children were little, we would get in the car, and, 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 and we, would, we would go somewhere, and I would drive them there, and they would hold, I would get out of the car, and they'd hold my little hand, and they're the child, and they walk with me. And they follow me. And then we get back into the car and we go home. And they realize when we arrive at home. Why? Because I've taken them home so many times. They know where home is. I've led them to these places. And never once, I, I, never once did I ever get in the car with my children. And my children look at me and say, Dad, are you capable of driving this car? Which, by the way, if I'm being honest, is a, is a pretty valid question. Because in my family, everybody knows in my family that my wife is a far superior driver than I am. So it's a valid question. Like when I get in the car, I'm driving and I'm like, is that new? How long has that been there? My wife's like, keep your eyes on the road, please. All the time. The point is this. The point is this. Not my driving. The point is this. I'm their dad. They trust that I will take them. They trust that I will drive them. They trust that I will lead them. My children have never asked to be the dad in the relationship. They know who they are. They are the child. I am the father. We are a family. And so how do you and I become children of God? It starts with knowing our role. If you're taking notes today, write this down. We are children. He is the father. You and I were children. He is our Father. It's up to you and I to realize and, and to accept that role in this relationship. And when we accept that role, there's this, there's this childlike like wonder that goes with it. There's this childlike trust in that relationship of father and child. The question today for you and I is, do you have it? Have you ever experienced that childlike wonder in your relationship with the Father? Do you remember the first time that it happened? Do you remember the first time that you realized, hold on, there is a God, and that God is the creator, and the creator loves me, and he loves me enough that he sent Jesus for me. He who, 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 who knew no sin became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God. My Father, my God loves me, and he accepts me, and then I get to be an heir in his kingdom. How crazy is that? That he is my Father, and I'm his child. I can't even believe it. See, that's how it starts for you and I. It's an, an, an awakening to his goodness. It's an awakening to his grace, an awakening to his forgiveness, and an awakening to his love. My question today is, do you remember that awakening? Everywhere you went, 
in those moments. You told somebody about who God was to you. You, sold, you told somebody about what he's done for you. Somebody would look at you and go, hey, how have you been? And you're like, I've never been better. I met Jesus and he changed my life. My God is not only my creator, but he's my father. And you wore that with a smile and you couldn't hide it. It was like you went to Walmart with your mom and she looked at you and said, you want to get something today? And you're like, oh my gosh, do I really get to get something? Like you wanted to show everybody what you got. Look at my new doll. Look at my new car. See this trophy? I won this trophy in a soccer game. You're like, hey, look, I lost my tooth last week. See, see, see the tooth that I'm missing? Listen, that's not childish. That is childlike, and there's a difference. Because that's what children do. That's when, that's when me as a dad, when my kids get excited about something, and I see the smile on their face, and they want to tell everybody about it, I'm looking down at my child who is glowing. I can look at them and go, that's my kid. That's my child. It's fresh and it's new. So my question for you today is, do you still have that? Because you and I, we are, we are, we are called as, as a child of God to keep that. Why? Because that's, that's what it's like to be led by him and led by his spirit. Where we come to a place where we're like, God, where are we going today? Where are we going? I'm just in the car, God. My hand is in your hand. I'm with you. If you're leading me, I will follow you. Son, it's like, son, you want to go to town today? Yes. Can I go to town? Can we? Can we please go to town today? That's a relationship with the Father. See, here's the problem, though, I think for us, is this thing called knowledge comes in. And knowledge can get in the way of trust. Can it? Knowledge can get in the way of trust. To, to this day, when it comes to my children, one of the things that drives me crazy, and not in a good way, is when I ask or I tell my children to do something, and they respond with, I know. I'm like, hey, son, I need you to, I need you to do this thing. I know. I know, Dad. Hey, son, I, hey, don't forget. I told you to do this thing. I need you to do this thing. I know. See, here's the thing about that. If you knew when you've already done it without me asking you to do it, right? If it was going to work, wouldn't it have worked by now? See, the truth is, you don't know, son. You think you know, but you don't know. And as children of God, knowledge for us can get in the way of trust. Do you ever, ever arrive at, at, at this place in life where it's like, a, it's like an intersection for us. And, and maybe the, the problem is over here, but right across from you at the intersection is your past, and your past won't let up, and it just continues to stare you down. So you got the problem, you got the past, and then over here maybe you have knowledge or, or trust or faith, and, and so you're sitting at this, this intersection of life, if you will, and you're like, okay, God, which way do I go? Because I'm, I'm really confused, I'm really uncertain, and there's too many options here that I'm staring at and I'm looking at in life. And I just want to encourage you today that if that is where you are in life, that intersection, let me encourage you, you're at the right place. Maybe you're like, man, I'm, I'm so confused right now. You're at the right place. You're at the right place. Maybe you're like, I'm, I'm so unsure and I'm not sure. And you feel like this is an intersection with too many options. And I'm telling you, God is right there with you. And he wants you in that moment. I heard when I was very young, and I've always wrestled with this phrase, but I've heard the phrase, you know, the safest place to be is in the will of God. And while that may be true, the safest place to be is in the will of God, it's also the scariest place, isn't it? Matter of fact, somebody here today, no doubt, somebody here today, God is, God is asking you to do something, but it doesn't make sense to you. And you keep waiting on it to make sense. And then maybe once it starts to make sense for you, then you can move. But I've got news for you, it's not going to make sense. And it maybe never will make sense. And I just want to tell you this. Listen, you're, you're going to have to trust God on this one. You're going to have to step out and trust God. I want to look again at this, at this verse in, in, in Mark uh, chapter 10 of what Jesus says. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. 
anyone who doesn't receive, everybody say receive, who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And so knowing what Jesus says in this moment, ask yourself this question today. Do I accept and receive or do I try and earn and deserve? Do I, when it comes to our faith, when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to our faith in Jesus, do do we accept and receive what he has for us or do we try and earn and deserve it? Because we can't do both. And so my question for you today is, which one are you? Do you accept and receive or do you try and earn and deserve? I want to look at Romans 8, 14 again. We're, we're right back here at what Paul said. He said, you did not receive the Spirit. I want you to notice in, in, in your Bible, not on the screen. In the screen, they're all capital letters. But in your Bible, there's a lowercase spirit here, which means you did not receive the Spirit, which is like a, a mental tendency for you and I lowercase spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received, everybody say received, you've received the capital S, the Holy Spirit of adoption. Received means, means there's, there's nothing that you did to gain it. You received it. But, but our mental tendency is in our flesh. But now here's what's, here's what's so cool about the Holy Spirit. Now that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, once you recognize who Jesus is and that God is your Father, Jesus is your Savior, He died for your sins, you receive Him as, as, as your Savior, then the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Now your, your knee-jerk reaction is not to do what you want to do. It's no longer your knee-jerk. It's, now you want to not live by the flesh because you know that it ends in death. But instead, you want to be led by the Spirit. I think some of us need to be encouraged today that when you dabble over here, yet the Spirit lives inside of you, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will begin to tell you, "Uh -uh. uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not not where I called you. That's not where you're called. And we're like, yeah, but it kind of feels good. And, And the Holy Spirit says, it's not about your feelings. It's about your Savior. It's about the Spirit that lives within you. And then, and then, and then you, I think that we should thank God for his Holy Spirit in these moments. Because we didn't have his Holy Spirit before. But now you do. Before you were left to just dabble of your own will and, and feel nothing in it. And now he's, he's prompting you to kind of step back. And sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes you you may still choose things to dabble in, but I want want to remind you that you choose them. You may still choose those things, but you're still a child of God. And like the cow that was in my dad's field, there may be moments for you and I where we we want to sit there and we feel like we can't get up and we feel like we're stuck. But listen to me today. Thank God that you don't have to die there. Why? Because Jesus already died for you so you didn't have to be there and stay there. There's this cool thing that happens when you and I are, are, are dabbling in a place that we shouldn't. The Holy Spirit leads us and then all of a sudden we're like, hold up. I don't, I don't even want to be here. I don't even, that's, that's not who I am. I, don't, I, don't, I just feel like I don't belong here. And that's true because the Holy Spirit lives in you and he wants to move you beyond that. And so maybe today some of you, you need to celebrate the change that the Holy Spirit has made in you. He has changed your life and how you respond to life. You know, one of the things that, that I think allows us to get kind of stuck in these moments of dabbling is when we, we begin to feel not good enough. And we're like, well, I, you know, here I am again. I just, I just keep doing the same things. I mean, I must, I must not be good enough to, 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 to be with God. I must not be good enough to get to where he's called. We try to earn and deserve rather than accept and receive. But I want you to keep in mind that though you chose this place, you yourself are chosen by God. You didn't earn the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. You didn't deserve the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Paul said you have received it. God chose you. And because God chose you and I, we are called, I want you to write this down today, we are called to grow beyond trying to be good enough. We're 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 called to grow beyond good enough. This just in, you and I are not good enough. 
we never will be. If you were good enough, we wouldn't need Jesus. This is literally why I I think so many people refuse to be led by the Holy Spirit. It's because of the moments where we feel not good enough. You know why so many people have stayed home from church today? They didn't feel good enough to be here. Yet Jesus says, you're not good enough, so I chose you. So that you would be good enough. He he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. He chose you. See, here's here's where I think that we confuse um, where the world calls us versus where God calls us. Write this down today. While the world begs you to ask what's expected, God calls you to ask what's next. The world will say, hey, they want you to call out and say, what do you expect from me, world? What do you expect from me? By the way, if you live from a place of what's expected, you could do that if you like, but I've got news for you. You will never live up to what's expected of you. Never. And you will kill yourself trying to live up to it. Meanwhile, Jesus, in all his goodness and in all his kindness, says, I give you the spirit of adoption. Jesus says, I chose you. Jesus chose you. Jesus chose me. I didn't choose him. He chose me. I'm chosen by him. Therefore, I I, I get to move from what's expected to what's next, God? What's next? I wonder if for, for many of us today, maybe you're here in, Maybe you're not lost, but I wonder if you've lost your what's next. You haven't had a what's next in years. For some of you today, you've had two children since your last what's next. Maybe for others, we're we're too busy trying to live from from what's expected to even think about what's next. Maybe for others, we're, we're trying to live from a place of what I've done, and we can't think about or even believe that we could ever get to a place of what's next, God. And, and, and we can't move past our past. I think for some of us, we've lost our what's next. And so just let me remind you today, God chose you because of who he is, not because of who you've been. God chose you because of who he is, not because of who you've been. And so you know what that means? That means that that you and I have every right to what's next. So many of us will respond, though, to that, and and we'll push back on that and come from this place where, well, you, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know what I've done, Paul. You don't know my past. You know that story that Jesus told? He was telling a, a series of stories, uh, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and then he told the story of the lost son. We call it the prodigal son. Did you know in that story, when the son comes home, after making dumb decisions, after the son had gone to all the wrong places, he was doing things he shouldn't have done, he's been places he shouldn't have been, and the first thing the son comes back, when he comes back into the father's life, in the father's home, he's, he's, he's filled with all these, uh, these reasons, and these excuses, and these apologies, and even rehearsed it before he came home. Yet the father in the story never even listens to him. He never even listens to the lame explanation that the son brought. Why? Because he's so caught up in the fact that the son had come home that he refused, he refused to be bothered by the reasons for him coming home. He looked at his son and he said, son, I don't care. I'm just glad you're home. And God is the same way with you and I. It's the whole reason he even told this story to the people gathered there. God is looking at us today and he's going, here's the deal, child of mine. Your purpose and the plan that I have set out for you, that's the big deal. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter what brought you here. I'm glad you're here. This is what I have for you. And I believe that there are people in this room today and people listening online and you're continually anxious about what may come your way. You're continually anxious about what might happen. So much, so much that you're forgetting that God chose you in the first place. He knew that you would be here. He knew that you'd be listening to this right now. And when God chooses, I want to encourage you, when God chooses, God appoints. 
And then, here's what's cool about all of that in our story. Then, all of a sudden, when God chooses us, things in our life and all around us are forced. They are forced to fall in line with his plan. They can't deny it. They have to line up with what he has for you. Why? Because God is good and God chose you. Today, uh, I want to end with this, uh, with this verse that, that Paul wrote in the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul said, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Paul's like, what's next, God? What's next? I'm going to press on. Because Christ Jesus had made me his own. In other words, Jesus chose me. I'm a child of God. How do I know? Because I'm led by his spirit. Paul says this, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead. Forgetting it. One of the most, I think one of the most um, obvious characteristics of a child is that they have short memories. Parents, you know this to be true, right? You tell a child to do something, they walk about three steps, and they're like, what did you tell me to do, right? Kids just have short memories. I remember walking one time into, into one, of my, one of my boys' um, rooms one time, and I had yelled or something. I would flew off the handle or done something dumb, and I, I wanted to apologize to them. And I remember walking in, into their room, and I'm like, son, I, I just want to say I'm sorry for that thing that I did. I'm sorry that I got so upset so quickly. Can you forgive me? And I will never forget my son was like playing with cars and he's like, sure, dad. And I, I worked myself up to this place and I'm like, I just want to make sure you forgive me. Son, can you forgive me? And I remember him looking up at me, he's playing, he stops and he goes, wait, what did you do again, dad? And I was like, you know that, you know that thing, I, I, I got mad. And why are you making me repeat this now, son? I'm trying to live with myself. I, I got mad and I did this thing. And, and my son is like looking at me as almost as if to say, listen, Dad, I'm just playing with Hot Wheels, okay? I don't know what brought you. Dad, Dad you want to play with me? Would you sit down here and play with me? Seven times 70. It's easy for, for children. Seven times 70. They don't even remember half the stuff. But for us, it's not that easy, is it? I think for us, we, we hang on to stuff a whole lot longer than we should, right? It's easy for me to forgive you sometimes, but forgiving me, that's hard. And I hold on to it. And Jesus says, I've forgiven seven times 70. I just need you to have faith like a child. I just need you to, to look at me like a child. Jesus says, be a child. Paul says, I forget what lies behind like a child. I just leave it there. I don't, don't even, I don't even remember what it was. Dad, what was it again? What was I, what was I so worked up about? Dad, what was that anxious thought? Dad, Dad, what was that? Verse 14 says, I press on, Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, this look at this. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. Mature. See, I, I think what we've done as followers of Jesus and living in this world, I think we have a, a sense of, uh, we've warped our sense of maturity, haven't we? haven't we? Because I think the world says maturity is figuring it all out. If you're mature, then you'll find all the answers. You'll search and you'll find them and you'll have them all. And until you do, you're just going to be immature. But it's the opposite in the kingdom of heaven. Immaturity in the kingdom of heaven, it says, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know. I mean, maturity, sorry. Immaturity is when people, uh, religious people, say, I do have it all figured out. That's the kingdom of heaven. But maturity says, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know what, I don't even know where I'm going. I don't have any idea, God. I'm just along for the ride. I'm just, I'm just with you. I just want to follow you. God, I don't have the scripture memorized like I probably should, but you know what? I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to be led by your spirit, God. Forgetting, forgetting what lies behind. See, I used to think maturity in my Christian walk 
was how many days that I was good in between the bad days. The bad days were kind of bookends, and if I, if I could make it four or five days, I was doing pretty good, and I'm, I'm maturing in Christ. But now I see maturity as when I'm down, i got to get back up. When I'm down, i got to look up. i got to step up. i got to do better. And tomorrow, God says, hey, come back, and we'll do it again tomorrow. Hey, tomorrow, come back. Hey, and I'm going, hey, God, what's next? What is tomorrow? I don't know. We're going to go to town. We're going to go to town? I can't wait to go to town. And tomorrow, when God God says, we're going to do what's next, and we do that. And then the next day, we do that. And seven times 70, we do that, and we do that, and we do that. How many of us today are ready to start living a mature life like that? Amen? Amen? A few of you are. Awesome. I'm with you. I'm with you. Let's pray today. God, thank you so much for giving us your word. God, would you remind us this week uh, uh, of the truth of, of what mature means? God, would you remind us to... To not only have faith like a child, but God, live as a child, as a child of God. God, would you help us to forget things we should have forgotten a long time ago? God, would you move in our lives? Would you help us bring back that that excitement, bring back that, that joy that we once had? God, for some of us that have lost the what's next, will you help us find the what's next, God, so we can live that out during the week? God, what's next? I don't even know where we're going, but I'm excited about it. God, be with us this week. We love you, Jesus. And we all say, amen. Hey, thanks for being here today. Don't forget, Tuesday night is our midweek midweek study. I can't wait to help you uh, with that and teach that this Tuesday night, 6 to 7. And then today, right after this service, we're going to pick up these chairs and stack them up like we normally do for youth. But but we're going to... uh, uh, hang out with some, some new people and wanting to connect. And so if you're here today and you want to connect, stick around and, and ask us some questions and hang out with us. It'll be fun. All right, have a great week.